Hello, hello, good evening, and welcome back to our lessons. So here we are once again after the break. Um, it's great to have you back. It's great to be once again here, ready to start learning and start sharing some more information. So we are um, coming back from a break. Hopefully you guys had the opportunity to practice. And uh, well, I also hope you have had the chance to learn something new, which we are most likely going to be sharing um, during this evening's lesson. I would like to get to know what are like the new words or new phrases you might have heard or the ones you got to use. Of course, it's also important to know, um, or at least for me, what were some of the activities you guys developed and how did you spend your well-deserved free time? But before we get to any of that, I also want to explain something that we're going to be covering during this evening. We're going to be learning about um, something very special, which is um, have or get something done. Or, well, when we talk or use this structure, it is normally referred to something that we want people to do for us. So an activity that somebody else is going to perform, but the activity in the end is going to benefit us. So we're going to know or get to know today how to talk about that, how to refer to um, those situations. Now, apart from that, I also hope you guys are doing great. Um, this evening, probably you're also going to have a lot of participation as per usual. And another thing, is that we're also going to be solving the different activities available for section number two, because we need to close that, that, that up. Um, we have already finished section three, when in terms of like topics, we're also going to do a little, a little refreshment only about section three during this evening, but then we're going to go right straight into talking um, about section four. Okay, anyway. Buenas noches, bienvenidos a todos una vez más. Y eh, bueno, vamos a iniciar, ¿verdad? Eh, tal vez compartiendo un poco acerca de cómo estuvo eh, pues el descanso que tuvimos esta semana recién pasada. Y además, pues compartiendo, ¿verdad? Algo de las cosas que tal vez logramos aprender. Si es el caso, si no, pues eh, tal vez compartir un poco de las actividades que logramos realizar durante el tiempo de descanso. Anyway, um, who would like to start sharing? First, well, actually, I'm going to be calling you guys to particip participate this evening. And I would like to start with Evelyn. So, Evelyn, tell me, how are you doing? Hi, good evening, teacher. Good evening. Uh, um, so, wait. Uh, on my vacations, I went to, to visit my, my parents in San Miguel. Okay. It was too hot. Really, really hot. <laughs> <laughs> I only think that I, wa I want to run away from, from San Miguel and come back to Santa Tecla because it's, it's too different, the weather. But it, it was cool to share with my family. We have dinner, we play, and we talk about everything. So it was good. All right, pretty cool. You know, and that's the daily life for me. Living here in San Miguel, for example, yesterday was a horrible day in terms of heat. Um, today was pretty bad because um, last night we had some rain. And I don't know if it happens everywhere in the country, but at least here, when it rains, um, like the vapors that come out of, the, out of the soil are too hot to withstand. So today we had to go through a really, really hot day. So yeah, it's, it's pretty rough here in San Miguel. But it's nice to know that you had, you know, a good time. Now, Evelyn, let me know. Were you able to learn a new word or did you learn any new words or phrases in English? I, I didn't new words. All right. It's okay. It's okay. So that means that we have more space, you know, in, in our brains um, to get to learn something new during this week. All right, now, how about Emma? Tell me, Emma, um, how are you doing? And share something or share, share, us, share with us a bit of how did your week in the break go? 
Oh, I'm doing great. And for last week, I didn't do anything exciting, but I went to the mall to buy my hamburger. And pretty cool. After, after that, I just read uh, in a book about aviation because I have an exam this okay. Friday about it. And I watched around three seasons of anime and I didn't do anything else. All right. No, that's fine. You know, it's always great when you have some time to rest, some time to do um, so some of those spare time activities that we love to develop. So, yeah, it's it's pretty cool. Now, um, how about English? Did we did we learn any new words or any new phrases or did we practice at any moment, Emma? Yes, and that's why I have two questions because okay. I I don't understand the difference between the, those words. The first is what's the difference between ground and land? Oh. And in the difference between handbook and manual. All right. Cool. Very good. So the first one is ground, did you say? Yes. Ground and land. Yes, land, land as, as if in I uh, give you something. Okay, so the ones that I sent in the chat right now? Mm, the second one is L A and D. Oh, ground and land. All right, ground and yeah. land. All right, very good. Ground and land. Nice. So when we talk about ground, um, we are talking about the surface, like everything that is the surface of something everywhere where there's like um, earth and there is not necessarily water. So every time you're going to, to talk about uh, above ground is something that is above the level of the sea or above the level of, of water, any body of water. And now below or um, yeah, below ground or underground will be something that goes, um, well, as the word says, under that surface. So the surface is this and everything here is going to be um, under the ground. Así que sería básicamente solamente la superficie. Ground is referred to that, to like um, the upper level that we have. And when we talk about land, land is going to cover basically every space. And it's a, it, it's a word normally used um, to refer to, well, to a, a physical space, mostly in a political or, or social way to express who is the owner of that specific spot in, in on the ground or above ground. So when you talk, for example, this is my piece of land. So you're talking that that is your property. So you, we use or we're going to be using land to refer to something that is like um, measured and to some extent that can be taken as our property. So ground, just uh, to bear in mind, is going to be the surface, like the, the upper part, and land is going to be, um, or we're going to be using it normally to refer to the things that we may own as people or the things um, that somebody owns. Now, um, that's because that's the reason why it's um, well, you know, not commonly used as a um, as a word to describe something apart from that, apart from like the social or, well, lossial idea. Si, estamos hablando más que todo en un sistema, verdad, de um, legal, sí. Like uh, we're talking or describing something that we may own. And that is also the reason why we normally can get confused with uh, the words when we use landing, when we're talking about the, um, the, the planes or the airplanes, when they are landing, it means that they are coming to a specific, well, a specific place that has already been measured and prepared for them. And uh, when we talk about grounding or something that is grounded, is something that is, well, 
right on top or right right on the surface is not below is not above so something that is on the ground is just right there right on the surface you don't have to carve anything or you don't have to put anything up just so can um you can get you know to place that thing there so landing is used because that place has already been prepared and grounding is not going to be used necessarily with airplanes because airplanes need you know the, the runway or that prepared space. Así que la diferencia, por lo que menciono eso, sería el hecho de que, o sea, grounding, por ejemplo, un helicóptero puede ser grounded, porque el helicóptero puede aterrizar en cualquier lugar que no necesariamente haya sido preparado, ¿sí? En cambio, landing, o cuando los, los aviones están aterrizando, ellos aterrizan en un lugar que, o sea, está medido, está preparado y tiene como un montón de sistemas, asfalto y todo, ¿verdad? Lo que de alguna forma lo hace ya algo que, o sea, está por encima de la superficie y por eso es que no se va a, a decir, ¿verdad? That plane is grounding, porque grounding tendría que ser directamente sobre la tierra sin hacerle ninguna cl ningún clase, perdón, ninguna clase de cambio a esa tierra. Entonces, por eso los helicópteros, por lo general, se puede referir, ¿verdad? Que ellos están grounded or they ground, porque pues pueden aterrizar sobre superficies um, naturales. En cambio, los aviones por lo general hacen landing porque son superficies ya preparadas, superficies medidas, superficies um, que se utilizan específicamente para eso. Ok, now, the other ones were, sorry, I forgot, Emma. Handbook and manual. Ok, handbook and manual. And in this case, I think this one is going to um surpass my knowledge so i'm going to do a quick search uh handbook and manual difference give me one sec okay so here we have it so the main difference uh, will be that a manual is a handbook while a handbook is typically organized book of reference in a certain field of knowledge disregarding the size of it all right so um no sir here we have it the handbook sets the tone for your for your organization by outlining your policies all right so that's it a handbook we're going to use a handbook as instructions and it's basically the same as a manual but a, a manual is going to be used when we're talking about objects when we have instructions on how something has to be um, used or how something has to be built up or how you are going to um, to fix something but a handbook and this is why I, I was I was still like you know rolling that word in my head is used when you talk about um, enterprises or companies so a handbook is a list of instructions that you will get from your boss or you will get normally from um, someone that is trying to help you to be guided or well guided in an institution. So handbooks are normally used for institutional purposes or to provide you instructions in terms of, of how you're going to be um, expected to do something in an institution. In a manual normally is going to be used for things you're going to build, be building up. So instructions on how you are supposed to do this, that, or the other thing. So handbook, we can also refer to it as something um, related to your behavior, how you are going to um, refer to others or talk to others. And manual is going to provide you more specific details on how you're going to get there. Like what are the steps you have to follow so you can get to a result. So handbook, instructions, and manual is going to be a step-by-step -step, um, description on how something is supposed to be done. Now, once again, uh, we, don't are, we don't use them um, in the same way. A handbook, for example, can cover what a manual does, but a manual is not going to cover what a handbook does. All right, I hope I have been able to provide you an, an idea on how we're going to use this, these words. They are very tricky sometimes. The ones that I like best 
uh, if I'm to be honest, is the one between land and, and, and ground, because that's something that I already knew. Uh, and yeah, it's, it's a very common question, like how you're going to use uh, ground and land. But the other one was kind of tricky, but still, thank you for bringing the questions. And uh, okay, great. Did you get to, to learn anything about this or did you just um, thought of asking here, Emma? No, well, it's because in the book that I'm reading, there are many words like that. And I'm reading about handbook about take off the airplane in the wrong way. So I was confused because in some uh, paragraphs, uh, there are words that mean ground and other paragraphs just say uh, land. land. Yes. And I, I didn't understand why. Uh, All right. But now I know. Thank you. No, you're very welcome. You're very welcome. All right. Now, uh, moving on to Melissa. So tell me, Melissa, how are you? And um, please share some of the activities or the things you did during the break. Hi, teacher. Uh, on my break, um, I went to the Tungo Beach, but, oh. only, but only for it because I don't like the beach. Yeah, it's too rocky, right? Yes. Yeah. Yes. And so uh, we went uh, to the Suchitoto. Oh, cool. That's uh -huh. a really yes. nice town. And, and uh, visited to my friend, my best friend. I have a lot of time that we can see. Okay. Um, and also I try to watch movies and series in English. Mm -hmm. And I and I learn one idiom. Oh cool. Which one yes, is it? To pack it in it in. Sorry, what was that again? Is to pack it in. To pack it in? Yes. To pack it in. Yeah, to pack, to pack it in, which means, according to you, ¿cuál sería el significado de eso? ¿Cuál fue lo, lo que uh, to pack it in? Is uh, the same to finish an activity? Yes, there we go. It's basically mm -hmm. the same as when we say to wrap it up. That's something I normally use uh, at the end of the classes, to wrap it up. So it will be um, just when we're going, uh, when we're about to finish something, to pack it in. So you're going to put it, put it in the pack, you know, you're going to close it and that's done. To wrap it up is also similar to that. However, wrap uh, is going to be used when we're talking about gifts or when we're talking about, well, just, you know, having a piece of something cover another something. So that's a wrap. So to wrap it up. Those two are very similar in meaning. So pretty cool. Thank you very much, Melissa. How about you? Welcome, teacher. Okay. How about you, Joel? How are you doing? And how was your week during the break? Hi, good evening. Well, actually, they were lazy days. I just visited my father and I slept a lot. Also, I watched uh, a lot of old sitcoms like Malcolm in the Middle and some old movies as well. <clears throat> Moreover, <clears throat> sorry, I'm a little bit bad. Okay. <clears throat> I download an app, an app called Elsa, where I practice my English. It's a good app. Oh. I learned uh, just, I, I just did about two lessons, but I learned one idiom and one new word. The new word is overall, which means in general in Spanish. Yeah. Yes, overall. And the idiom is, in the idiom is to gain fascinating insight into, which means para obtener una visión fascinante de. So, for example, to gain fascinating insight into English, you have to master the language. That could be an example. Yes. Basically, okay. that's all. Insight into. All right. So, to get fascinating insight into. Um, pretty cool. So, you can get to... Uh, you can get to get 
wait, no, sorry. You can get fascinating insight into English, as you said, by mastering the language. That will be a very good option or on how you can use this idiom. However, it's kind of tricky though. I mean, it's, it's not an idiom you're going to hear um, every day because it, it's a little bit tricky and not as common, but still pretty cool that you got to learn something new. Um, how about, so you didn't have any, any trips? You spend your days at home, Joel? Yes, I just slept a lot. And as I told you, I just visited my father. Oh, yeah. In Suchitoto. Okay. But I hate there because it's too hot for me. Oh, come on. It's not San Miguel. <laughs> yes. Now, it's kind of similar. Tell me, um, do you remember the difference that I, I explained you guys between having a break and having a vacation? Okay, anyone who remembers that difference or who remembers the difference between having a break and having a vacation? When you go on vacation, what is it or what makes it different from having a break? Teacher, maybe is a short time. Mm, to some extent, they are similar in terms of timing. Like, I mean, one of you guys could have been gone on a vacation the whole time in which the rest of us was on the break. So it's not necessarily that. Now, but I there, right there, I mentioned a detail that is relevant to getting um, that difference. You know, when you go on a vacation, it is when you travel, when you leave your house and you go to a different place. When you have a break is something like what Hoel had. I mean, and me, myself also. Um, but putting Joel as an example from you guys, and he mentioned that he didn't do many, many trips. He didn't go um, to many places. He simply just went to visit his dad, and then he spent the rest of his days just watching some, sit some sitcoms, some old movies, and to some extent, probably practicing English or studying, you know, something new. Um, so, yeah, that is what we can take as a break. But for those of you who went to, well, in your case, you, you said you went to El Tunco, but just to eat, but still you travel and that can be counted as a vacation. So when you go on vacation, it is that, uh, or the meaning is that you're going to be traveling to a different place. Now, just please keep that in mind because normally in Spanish, we only say we have a vacation. But in English, we have those two differences. So when you're telling people, oh yeah, we are going on vacation next week, it means that you're going to travel. You're going to go to a different place and you're not necessarily going to be home. However, if you simply um, are going to stay home while the rest of people are also, you know, having that free time, that means that you are on a break. See, la diferencia sería entonces... Um, pues la pobreza, ¿verdad? No, y los deseos de salir que podamos tener. El, el detalle de going on vacation is when you leave your home. And when you are only on a break is that when you are still at home, just, you know, having some free time. All right. Bueno, ¿alguna duda que les haya surgido durante este periodo? ¿Alguna situación que quisieran aclarar aparte de lo que ya hemos mencionado? ¿O tenemos todo eh, claro de momento? It's clear so far. All right, very good. Therefore, um, we are going then to be um, solving something. I want us to go ahead and complete all these activities. We have four of them. Uh, wait, no, it's only three of them. So we only have three of them. We have the first one, which, which is the trickiest one, I will say. And the restriction is very straightforward. Um, rewrite the sentences using passive and the preposition given. Don't forget to use capital letters and periods. So that's the instruction we have. Remember, this is from um, the second section where we were learning how to describe some problems. The first one was talking about problems. Now here we are getting to describe these problematic situations or these problems. And we have only four sentences and we have to rewrite the sentences 
um, placing them in passive voice and using also the preposition given in each and in, in every case. So here we have the preposition by. We're going to have to use by somewhere normally in the middle of this um, conversation to turn it into a passive voice. Now, how would you do that? How would you use um, those uh, instructions and turn this uh, sentence, air pollution is threatening the health of people in urban areas. How would you do that, Evelyn? The health of people in urban areas. Sorry. Uh, can okay. You hear me? Yes, 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 yes. Okay, okay, okay. I will start again. The health of people in urban areas. Um, is vain, is being treated. I don't know how to say that word. Will it be like this? Uh, threatened? Is being threatened? threatened. Like this? Yes, yes. By air pollution. It's being threatened by air pollution. Ooh, air pollution. All right, so. We'll discard it. We're gonna check it and it caught it. Yes, the health of people in urban areas is being threatened by air pollution. Very good. Now, how will we do this with this uh, next sentence? Livestock farms have contaminated soil and underground water. And then the, um, the proposition we have in this specific case is because of. How will we turn this active sentence into a passive? Melissa? Um, um, who is livestock, teacher? Oh, livestock? Uh -huh, yes. Livestock se refiere a cuando hablamos de granjas o las, um, perdón, las granjas como de ganado, sí. Livestock sería como el ganado, o sea, cuando hablamos de, de las granjas que son específicamente para el consumo, o sea, para um, matar a los animales, no necesariamente para que puedan vivir ellos a gusto, sino, ajá, solamente para poder consumirlos, ¿verdad? A eso se refiere, a ese tipo de granjas. So that's livestock. So tell me, how will we turn this sentence into a um, passive um, sentence? Maybe livestock farm have contaminated because of soil and... I will help you no, out. No. I will help you out a little bit and I will give you the start of the conversation of the of the sentence. It will be the first soil and underground underground water have contaminated. Mm -hmm. Have been contaminated because yes. Because of because of livestock farms. Livestock farms. Livestock yeah. farms. Livestock farms. There we go. So that will be our sentence. Now let's check it out. And apparently we got it right. So soil and underground water have been contaminated because of livestock farms. Very good. Now, how about this one? The burning of gas, oil, and coal has created acid rain. And the preposition we have is a sort of soul top. How are we going to turn this sentence into a passive sentence? Um, Emma. Acid rain has been created as a result of the burning of gas, oil, and coal. All right, as a result of the burning, of gas, oil, and coal. Now, do we know the meaning of coal? The word coal only. What is the meaning of this word, Emma? It is the thing that you receive when you born. 
Good. Good? Yes, right. there we go. Yet, and also we can get it from soil. I don't know how low. I have never really um, gotten, to un gotten to understand how is coal produced like on soil or on the ground. But some people mine it as a mineral. I don't, honestly don't know how that happens. But it's also a kind of mineral. Now, the most problematic coil is going to be that one, the one that is extracted from the earth, the one that is mined. But yeah, that's basically coal as well. The thing we get when we burn wood. All right, now the last one. The use of CFCs in products like hairspray has created a hole in the ozone layer. Now, the preposition is through. We already know, Joel, you're going to be in charge of this one. How are we going to turn this one into a passive? Okay. It would be a hole in the ozone layer has been created through the use of CFCs in products like hair sprays. Spray. Okay. Through the we use. One more time. It's okay. A hole. Okay. Okay. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. A hole in the ozone layer has has been created through the use of CFCs in products like hair spray. There we go. And we got them right. Very good. So we are doing amazing. So this is the first of the three different exercises in this section. Now we're going to move on, move on into the second one. This one is a listening practice. I have already solved it. So we're not going to spend too much time on this one. Now, it's pretty simple. You only have to listen to the people. Um, they're going to be providing some explanation on the situation that they're living or the situation that they want um, to explain. And, well, Jenny, the first one is going to be talking about landfills. Um, Adam is going to be talking about the, uh, the thinning on the ozone layer or off the ozone layer. And Kathy is going to be talking about water pollution. So those are the three different um, parts of this conversation. Now, this one is also very interesting. However, it's kind of simple either, um, either way. Now, in, sorry, instruction is pretty straightforward. Find one or more solutions for each problem. And here we're going to be reading this one's first and then the question. The first options as, you know, the options are going to repeat in the next questions. That's why I'm going to be reading this one's first, and then we're going to be going to the questions. Um, to, build, um, to build more public housing, that will be one of the options. To train people in modern, it will be modern. Farming methods will be another of the options. To start free vocational training programs will be the third one. To educate people um, on the streets, that will be the fourth one. To provide ways for people to voice their concerns, that will be the fifth one and to develop cleaner public transportation, the sixth one. Now, for the first um, sentence, we have one way to reduce famine is, what will be the best way to reduce famine? Will it be by educating people on the streets? What do you guys think? Can you repeat the pronunciation of this word, please? This one? Yeah, that. Yes, well, yes. it's I, I, I consider it will be famine. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so the what will be the best option on your ideas? The second, second option. Second option, to train people in modern farming methods. All right, very good. Moving on. The best way to fight HIV or AIDS is, what will be the best way to fight HIV, HIV or AIDS? What do you guys think? Would it be to provide ways for people to voice their concerns? To educate people in the streets. To educate people on the streets, very good. So that will be the best way to fight HIV or AIDS, as misinformation is a very tricky thing when we're dealing with um, situations as crucial, you know, as HIV or AIDS. All right, now the third one. One way to stop political unrest is, 
Will it be um, to start free vocational training programs? Well, maybe, but what do you guys consider to be the best option for this sentence to complete um, the statement for this problem? Uh, to provide ways for people to voice their concerns. All right, so one way to st stop political unrest is to provide ways for people to voice their concerns. Great. Now, number four, one thing to improve air quality is, one thing to improve air quality is, do you guys consider that it will be um, to educate people on the streets? Well, probably, you know, that could do something, but what is the best option in this case? The last, yeah, one. the last one to develop. Last one, yes, to develop cleaner public transportation. So that will help a lot in terms of improving air quality. Um, that's something that I don't know if it has been dealt dealt with, but the last few times I went to the capital, las últimas veces que estuve en Salvador, I noticed that most of your bosses they have huge amounts of pollution being released into the air. Um, so yeah, hopefully that is something that gets taken care of pretty soon because it's, it's really, really damaging. Anyway, um, the best way to reduce poverty is, um, do you think it would be the best way just to provide ways for people to voice their concerns? I don't think so, but what is the best option, guys? start free vocational training programs. All right, so to start free vocational um, training programs. And that gets us to the last one. And it will be one thing to help the homeless is, and this one is pretty straightforward. It will be the first one and it is um, to build more public housing. So that's what's going to help a lot with dealing with the homeless. Now, from this, actually, I want to get to hear your opinions on this one. I know it's not necessarily the thing we are supposed to be doing here, but I would like to hear your opinions. Do you guys think this um, sentence or this idea is accurate or how would you interpret this? The best way to reduce poverty is to start free vocational training programs. Do you think this is um, accurate or what do you think? Um, Evelyn. Let's go and start with you. ¿Qué cree usted? Do you think this is something that actually happens, that we can end poverty by educating our people? I think it could be a little bit of help, but that way won't reduce poverty. All right. All right. That's then your take on, on the matter. How about Emma? What do you think? What will be your take on this specific um, sentence? The best way to reduce poverty is to start free vocational training programs. What do you consider to be the best way to approach that? Can I say another option? That sure. Option that I, sure. Well, from my point of view, the best way to reduce poverty is to and make more opportunities to people who want to get a good job because i don't think that to give money is a good option i think that if we work hard for the things that we want to do we can improve our economy and if one person that don't doesn't want to work maybe we don't have the obligation to help them to go to lift how do you say salir de? Sorry? How can I say salir de, in, in this case, the poverty? Oh, get out of. Get out of. Well, yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. Just. If a person doesn't want to work and doesn't want to do something hard to improve their stability. Economy. Yeah, and get so out of their I don't situation. Think it's our, our obligation. Yes, and that's all right. All right, very cool. So, you know, providing more opportunities for people will be a better way. Now, free training or free vocational trainings are a way in which we provide opportunities, but you're right, they they are not necessarily the best option because 
like you may be well educated like super educated but if there's no jobs around then how are we gonna do so pretty good take now how about you well what do you think do you think the best way to reduce poverty is to start free vocational training programs yes i i think that is very accurate but also i would like to add uh, to keep the youngest one uh, busy in studying, you know, to make more more motivationally the classes, so they uh, develop these days, you know, for keeping studying and keeping uh, in their mind that they want a, a major for their life, and you know, to reach uh, a high degree in in college. Or I don't know. So. Yeah, but I, but I consider it's very accurate, that, that one. All right, very good. Thank you. How about Melissa? What would be your take on this, Melissa? Do you think the best way to reduce poverty is to start free vocational training programs? Um, I think that is good, but also I think that um, to educate or improve the education in the country, mm -hmm. uh, will be a good idea because uh, if necessary, the education for can um, uh, have or getting a good job, or maybe it's important uh, when the person uh, want to uh, want to be an uh, entrepreneurship, maybe, mm -hmm. on create programs about this all right very good yeah you know i actually um i think it was the last the last night that we had class so it would be last friday i don't remember well but i think it was last friday that i was supposed to go to bed but i decided to watch a movie because you know the break and i started watching this movie um the social network i don't know if you guys have ever seen that but it's about the creation of Facebook and how it all started, how the whole thing was, um, or it's supposed to have started. And uh, there was a line that I actually liked um, from, from that movie. And it is the fact that the dean, I think it was, in the Harvard University, he mentioned that in Harvard during those days, the students were not preparing for a job. The students were creating their jobs. So... But I think that cannot happen if you're not well educated, because if you don't have knowledge on a specific area, it's going to be very tricky for you to create your own job. But this also takes me to a story that I once heard from a high school teacher. He was a sociologist, and I remember him talking to us about how one time, and I think this is just like a kind of a legend it's not necessarily his own story but he will tell it as if it was his story but he mentioned how a community in Morasan they had a cow and everything depended on that cow like everything that the whole community did was just to take care of the cow and they were all working just to get food for the cow just to um, get or milk the cow and every time the cow was sick or the cow had any problem well the whole community will suffer. Now, what happened when they um, supposedly killed the cow was that the family had to come up with new ideas. They had to create something new. And it's something that I have seen that also took place during, well, the last few years with the pandemic. I noticed that many people came out of their cocoons or came out of their comfort zones and they started creating their own jobs. So I think this one is kind of accurate, but at the same time, it also needs some reinforcement from inspiring people, as some of you or one of you guys mentioned, how you can inspire, um, well, population to believe that they're not set on a stone, like they can go outside of the comfort zone and start also creating their own ideas. But okay, pretty cool. Now, Let's go into the class. I just wanted to get to know some of your ideas. I just wanted to, to share for a little bit and also practice if, if possible. All right. Um, just a question. Esa es una pregunta bastante personal que les quiero hacer y esa sí se las voy a hacer en español. 
Y es si ustedes, porque me parece que, o sea, no necesariamente todos, pero ustedes el programa lo reciben como un beneficio de, del trabajo o ustedes están pagando por él. O sea, um, no sé, en el caso de Evelyn, Elisa. En mi caso, bueno, no lo estoy pagando yo, pero como me descuentan del seguro social en mi trabajo, eso lo cubre el INSAFOR. Ah, ok, ok. Entonces, no, no pago. Súper. Um, ¿Qué tal, Melissa? El mismo caso, teacher, es por parte del trabajo, pero eh, se descuenta también del, del, del seguro. seguro. Ok. Uh -huh. Emma. Inicialmente el curso estaba para jóvenes también, así que era para jóvenes y trabajadores, aunque no eran parte del seguro. Ah, ok, pero si sí, sí tienes que pagarlo tú o cómo es el... Mm, no, no, solo completar los requisitos como de la beca. Ah, ok, no, no súper. Muy bien, ¿y Joel? En mi caso... Uh, bueno, sí, en mi caso es igual, en el trabajo, pero anteriormente yo estuve, estuve en este curso hace bastante, hace como un año, uh -huh. y lo hice como dice Emma, lo hice por mi cuenta, no estaba trabajando, puse que no cotizaba y me dieron la beca. En este momento que volví a hacer el proceso, sí puse que estaba trabajando y creo que me lo descuentan también, ni sabía eso, de hecho. Um, hace poco me quedé sin empleo también, de hecho, así que no sé cómo vamos a hacer para el siguiente mes, porque Recursos Humanos hacía el papeleo por mí, pero oh. supongo que ustedes de inglés, de inglés corporativo me van a explicar, ¿verdad? Si lo haría por mi cuenta o si me limitarían hasta aquí, realmente no sé. Supongo, que, no. supongo que lo van a hacer, porque igual en sí, mi caso... Sí, yo creería o sea... que sí, porque por ejemplo en mi caso no Ajá. lo llena Recursos Humanos la documentación, sino que sí estoy como afiliada al, al seguro, pero la beca es como personal. Personal. Entonces yo lleno mi propia documentación, así que no. me imagino que en el mismo caso sería. En mi caso sí lo llenaba, en mi caso sí lo llenaba Recursos Humanos. Eh, porque incluso la de Recursos Humanos me enviaba, me enviaba a mí los correos para decirme que todo estaba ya en, en orden. Uh -huh. en, en los ok. Bueno, yo recomendaría en ese caso específico que tal vez pudieses comunicarte con Paola, quien fue la que al otro día mandó un mensaje diciendo que iba a ser la encargada, porque, um, bueno, por lo mismo, ¿verdad? La situación de la pandemia... Eh, muchos de nosotros los facilitadores en realidad no, no conocemos a fondo cómo es todo el funcionamiento, ¿verdad? De corporativo. En mi caso, yo tengo ya alrededor de seis meses, poquito más, trabajando con ellos, pero no necesariamente yo he sido parte de ninguna cuestión administrativa. Entonces, y a cada rato los estudiantes tienen preguntas como esas y por eso les preguntaba, porque, o sea, es algo que es importante, ¿verdad? También conocerlo. Así para saber si los puedo amenazar que se van a perder la beca en el caso que, que vayamos fallando en algo. Pero bueno, la cosa es que sería mejor que te comunicaras con ella para poder aclarar quizá desde ahorita, ¿verdad? Que estamos a mitad del curso. Eh, sí. ¿Cuál podría ser como el, el escenario, ¿verdad? Para el, para el seguimiento del proceso. Porque sí, yo no sabría decirte ni decirle a ninguno de ustedes cómo funciona. Por eso es que yo casi siempre les pregunto. Porque a veces conocen más ustedes que yo mismo, ¿verdad? De cómo funciona todo esto por el caso de la longevidad que muchos tienen ya con corporativo y pues que yo no necesariamente tengo tanto, tanto tiempo acá, ni tampoco, eh, bueno, conozco las oficinas, fui una vez, pero por algo bien esporádico, estaba con una amiga que fue quien, eh, pues, de cierta forma me, me contactó con quien antes era la directora, pero... Aparte de eso, o sea, no es que yo haya ingresado nunca, ni haya tenido clases presenciales, ni nada. Pero bueno, eh, sería bueno, Joel, que sí, o sea, si está esa como incertidumbre, sí. ¿verdad? Que te comuniques con ellos. Sí, lo voy a tomar en cuenta. De hecho, creo que lo estaría haciendo mañana para ver. De igual manera, tengo entendido, tengo entendido, no desconozco también exactamente esta información, pero cuando uno eh, cambia de trabajo o, o renuncia o lo reportan en personal, Creo que el seguro sigue por tres meses más, entonces creo que igual no habría problema referente a si estoy cotizando, pero le voy a escribir a ella. Ajá. Sí, sería lo mejor para saber, porque ella, o sea, sería la encargada de toda la situación, ¿verdad? Del papeleo y todo lo que tenga que ver con el seguimiento de um, tanto su asistencia como sus notas, 
Entonces, o sea, se ha dividido pues ahora el trabajo de esa forma y las personas de administración son quienes se encargan de la mayoría de cosas eh, que tienen que ver pues específicamente con eso, ¿verdad? Con la administración. Pero bueno, ok, so um, now we're going to learn something for a couple of minutes. We only have, well, around 10 minutes more. It, ooh, my bad. We're going to get to talk about this topic, which we have already covered, but we, ha we haven't actually fully covered it. Um, I think we haven't really talked about this, how we are going to be using or the three main uses we have for this um, structure, the by plus gerund. Now, the gerunds, as I have already mentioned, are a specific characteristic of the English language. No other language, or at least not um, Spanish, doesn't have a characteristic or a structure that we can replace with a gerund or we can use instead of a gerund. So this do not exist in Spanish. Now, one of the things about the gerunds is that they are very polyphacetic, like they can be used in many different places and for many things. Three of the uses for this structure, not for the gerunds, but for this structure, by plus gerund will be the following. For example, you can use it to say how something can be done. Yeah, just to say, not necessarily to describe, just to say, just an opinion on how something can be done. And an example would be, you can improve your English by doing a lot of reading. So that is just a statement. You know, what I have heard or what I have learned. Um, so when you say, remember, it's only an outage of the voice, something you want to share. Now, the second use would be to describe how something was done. So how something happened. I learned a lot of idioms by watching TV. So this is also one of the uses or one of the things you can explain or um, express by using by plus gerund. So I learned a lot of idioms by watching TV. So this is something that has already happened. And then the last use is going to be to describe how something could be done. One way of becoming fluent is by talking a lot in class. And that's what I've been trying to make you guys do this evening. Now, the differences here, or the main differences. The first one, this is all in present time. So everything here is in present time. Therefore, this is only a statement. So, si cuando hablamos de un statement, hablamos como de una afirmación. So, um, you can improve your English by doing a lot of reading. That is just the thing that is going to happen. Now, this one over here, when you're going to describe how something was done, of course, we're going to be using a past tense for the verb. So, that's what we have to keep in mind. We're going to use it in the past. I learned, not I learned, but I learned a lot of idioms by watching TV. Um, so here we're using the past structure. And when we want to describe how something could be done, we use is. Before we use uh, by plus the gerund, we use is. One way of becoming fluent is by talking a lot in class. Now, Taking this as examples, now we're going to create our own. And I would like to start by hearing from Joel. So Joel, provide me please with one example you could use for the first of the uses we have for the gerund, for by plus gerund. For the first use, what would be something you would say um, mm -hmm. using that structure? Okay, let me think. Um, for example, could it be you can you can learn how to cook by watching TV cook, cook cooking programs? Cooking programs. Okay, you can learn how to cook by watching by watching cooking programs. Yes. Okay, so there we go. If it, that could be yes, good. it is a good example. It is a good example because um, we are actually covering, you know, the explanation or the statement. So this is just 
a random statement, something I want to say. You can learn how to cook by watching cooking programs. That can happen. I think it has happened. So very cool. Now, from Evelyn, please provide me with an example with the second use, how you would describe how something was done. Remember here, we're going to use the past structure. So um, how would you do, or um, what will be an example you can provide, Evelyn? I learned to do mountain cycling by practicing every weekend. I learned to what, sorry? To do, I, I don't know if to do mountain cycling. To oh, do okay. Mountain cycling by? Practicing. All every right. Week. By practicing every weekend or every week. Every week. Every week. All right. So by practicing every week. Thank you very much. I learned to do mountain cycling by practicing every week. Nicely done. And for the last one, to describe how something could be done. How would you do that, Emma? Um, one way of learning cooking recipes is by watching videos in YouTube. Okay, one way of learning cooking recipes. Yeah, recipes is by watching videos on YouTube. All right, so videos on YouTube, recipes, what's wrong with you? Oh, sorry. All right, so there we go. Now, it's very important, very, very important for you guys to remember, you're not always going to be using the same verbs. For example, here, we can use something different. We can say, for example, I um, traveled, I traveled, ooh, I traveled to Europe just to say something. I traveled to Europe by saving, let's say, $50 each month. Entonces, tenemos una oración, ¿verdad? En pasado, viajé a Europa, sí, a través de guardar o al guardar 50 dólares cada mes. So, I traveled to Europe by saving uh, $50, $50 each month. And here... We can, instead of saying one way, we can say something you can do, something you can do. Eso podría ser un poco más largo, claro, eso sí. Something you can do to learn cooking recipes. Oh, wait, no, 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 no. Wait, 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 no, 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 no. Era diferente como lo había pensado. Dang it, I forgot. It was not something you can do. Uh, something to, no. Something, my God, no, my bad, guys. Cuando le estaba diciendo Emma, se me ocurrió la otra forma, porque no necesariamente nos vamos a quedar siempre, ¿verdad? Um, con el one way, o sea, podemos utilizar otra forma. Pero se me fue, así que me queda de tarea. Porque sí la tenía en la mente cuando Emma dijo la oración, pero con la otra se me olvidó. Evelyn, perdón, ¿iba a mencionar? No, I was thinking that if you can say something that you can try. Um, not necessarily because here is the problem. Cuando llegamos aquí sería el problema, que aquí se va a perder el significado. Sí, porque decimos something you can try, algo que puedas intentar, sería a través de... Ver videos, sería raro, ¿verdad? Esa, esa forma. Y el detalle es por lo mismo, porque como estos gerunds no existen en español, suena bien raro traducirlo. O sea, porque aquí sería, eh, si yo lo digo en español, sería por viendo. Y por eso es que muchos niños, cuando ellos vienen de Estados Unidos, hablan de esa forma. Sí, o sea, ellos pueden decir, ¿verdad? Um, ¿Qué sé yo? Quiero ir... A, a San Miguel por manejando el carro, entonces 
porque esto, los gerunds, no tienen una traducción directa. Siempre que llegamos a una, a una oración como esta o una sección como esta, tenemos que buscar una manera en la cual acomodemos este, eh, este espacio, esta palabrita, a una manera que utilicemos en español, porque en español no existe el gerund. Entonces, la forma de traducirlo sería, o sea, así, ¿verdad? Por eso les dije, cuando, por, eso, por eso sonó raro cuando les dije aquí, por guardando, o sea, porque así sería en inglés, por guardando 50 dólares al mes, pero es porque en español, o sea, no existe directamente una forma de traducir eh, los gerundios. Pero bueno, eso será algo que continuemos conversando más adelante. Uh, for now, I think this is it for the class this evening. I wanted to thank you guys very much for being back. And tomorrow, well, we're going to have something else so we can learn. Um, thank you once again. I hope you guys get to enjoy your evenings. If it rains, well, please enjoy it a lot. And I will be seeing you here tomorrow night. So see you tomorrow. Have a really good night. Bye, teacher. Bye-bye.